Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Joining us today is Ira Harris. Ira is an independent trader, uh, in a previous life a successful hedge fund manager. Um, Analysts, a global macro consultant, trading foreign currencies, bonds, commodities, and equities for about 40 years. Uh, Ira was also a CME director from 1997 to 2003. Welcome, Ira. Richard, thanks. Always a pleasure. I love doing these because we get to some really nice, nice deep issues. So, Yeah, exactly. Let's, ha- let's have at it, as they say. Okay, great topics. I guess we can begin with um, the the new president, Donald Trump. Uh, what what do you see as um, the effects on the markets, uh, short term, medium term, long term? Uh, do you think there, um, you know, he, he will be successful in uh, in steering an expedited uh, regulatory framework? Um, do you think he'll he'll initiate corporate tax reform? Uh, do you think there'll be uh, adverse effects on, on trade? Well, you know, I think we talked, we touched on some of this when uh, last time when I had the uh, wonderful opportunity of being on with you and uh, Peter Bookvar. Um, you know, this is going to be a slow grinding process. You know, as, as uh, Otto von Bismarck famously said, you know, uh, the legislative process is like watching a sausage being made. Yeah. And that's, that's what's going to happen. He's doing the executive actions, which has every, there's a lot of animal spirits, um, to paraphrase uh, Keynes, uh, being pushed into the market here because the two pillars, and, and it's the two pillars that go back when Rick Santelli had laid this out about a month and a half ago. <laughs> when he looked, he said, if, if Donald Trump in his first term does nothing but roll back uh, regulation and really get tax reform. And I'm a big advocate of tax reform. I, I thought that one of the worst things that Obama, President Obama did was to walk away from Bowl Simpson. And yes, I know the politics of it, but real leadership requires that you have to gore everybody's ox. That, that's what leadership is. And Donald Trump seems to have that. He, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things to dislike about Donald Trump, but right now he's really showing some leadership in that he's willing to gore a lot of oxes. Everybody thinks that they know what, what, he, what he means and what he says, but it's, it's more nuanced than that when you listen to him. It's like the NAFTA deal. Well, it was, he says, it's not, he wants to renegotiate NAFTA. And believe me, I've read many books from the left and from the right who would agree with him about absolutely renegotiating. In fact, one of the best books uh, written by, was written by Jeffrey Faw, The Global Class War, and it was written in 206, and it ripped the Clintons and Bob Rubin and uh, Larry Summers and, and the Bushes for the whole NAFTA deal. So this is not new stuff, and he seems to be reading from that. And I thought it was interesting this morning uh, that Peter, Peter Navarro, who I have a lot of differences over the years. I've, I've read a lot of things that he's written. But he's not he's no, no fool. He understands how the world works. And he's, um, he made some comments when asked uh, in the interview about uh, Mexico and Canada. And he said, look it, we're going to renegotiate this and our relations. And I'm, 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 I think I'm quoting, but I'll say I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it written down. And I actually went back to try to find it and I couldn't. But that relations with Mexico and Canada will be much stronger after this negotiation takes place. And, I, and I'll tell you what, I, 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 you know, well, we can get into that, but I've been sitting and waiting to write a blog. The Mexican peso, by all fundamentals, is one of the most undervalued assets in the world. It just is. The the currency has depreciated 700% since January 1st, 1994, the beginning of NAFTA. The beginning of NAFTA. The the peso was at 3.2 to the dollar. 3.2 on January 1st. 
That's also, you know, as we've talked, I know previously, that's also the same day that the Chinese devalued the yuan by 50% from 5.8 yuan to the dollar to 8.7. So, you know, a lot of things are in play here. And when you look at the value of the peso, outside of an absolute closing of, of, of the border, which would be ridiculous because the supply chain, you'll shut down America. It's just ridiculous. And the same from Canada. You know, the auto parts business, there's so many auto parts. <clears throat> so really, uh, if he wants to talk about currency manipulation, it's the Mexicans, but the Mexicans haven't done it. But they, In fact, they've tried to hold the currency. They don't like the weakness of the currency, uh, but the world has done it because in my, um, in, in my colorful language, I would say that the Mexican peso has become the world's pissing post for anybody who, who, okay. who has emerging market um, yeah. exposure. They go and sell the peso. Oh, I'm going to sell the peso. Why? Because it's the most liquid. But it's driven it to what? Where, where am I looking at right now? Uh, 21, uh, 28. Uh, so 21.28 pesos to the dollar. I mean, it's truly preposterous because for a currency to value that much, it would have to be choking on, on debt, which Mexico isn't, or it would have to be going through phenomenal deflation, which would be, I mean, I'm sorry, inflation, which would be an effort to, of course, um, uh, erase and eradicate their debt. They're not suffering any of those. So on a relative value basis, I, Mexico is just an unbelievable value. But, the mar you know, I respect markets, so I'm, I'm kind of quiet there. Yeah, and somewhere up in Canada, uh, right now we're at 70 for, you know, yeah. for, for the exchange rate. And, um, uh, yeah, it's 130, 13080 as we talk. Yeah, yeah, on, on the other side. Yeah. And, right. um, and, and basically um, Canada being the other member of NAFTA as well, um, you know, there, there's a strong um, dependence of Canada on the U.S. economy. Uh, probably somewhere between 75 to 90 percent have worked with models that that uh, look at the coupling. So it's quite high, right? As as you mentioned, also with Mexico. So there's mm -hmm. a massive amount of trade, NAFTA wise. You know, with, with the yeah. U.S. Yeah, the Canadian dollar, as weak as it is to where it was uh, seven, eight years ago. Yeah, but over a historical period, it's kind of medium, you know, because we've seen the Canadian at 1.70, and we saw it at, uh, you know, uh, above, above a, uh, a U.S. dollar. It was, a, in fact, almost a dollar nine, a dollar ten when energy prices were running high, and we know how <coughs> susceptible Canada is to high energy prices. So, yeah. That bears watching, too. Uh, it sort of goes al along um, in connection with one of your recent comments. Uh, um, you were referencing the, the Ford CEO and then cited the uh, Project Syndicate article uh, by Carmen Reinhardt, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, where, uh, where she writes, uh, President-elect Trump campaigned on a promise to bring back U.S. manufacturing, even if doing so requires imposed tariffs dismantling trade arrangements. Yet a strong dollar is a major obstacle to fulfilling his promise. Perhaps financial markets will begin to perceive the dollar as currently overvalued and retrench. If not, will it be time for another plaza-style accord? More important, who will be willing to cooperate? Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, thanks. That, was, that came out, you know, that's what I wrote yesterday. And that was in response you know, Trump had all the CEOs of the auto industry, auto parts, uh, all, and especially the big three. And Mark Fields came out from that meeting. Of course, the press was was out there, and they asked him a question and his thoughts about uh, uh, Trump's uh, executive uh, order to uh, you know to cease and desist the Trans Pacific Partnership (TPP). Yeah, and and I w I. Honestly, was sitting there, Richard, waiting for the answer to be, uh, you know, well, we don't agree with that. We're a global, you know, uh, Ford, certainly Ford's been a, a, a multinational, you know, you know, as a, you know, if I can regress for a minute, that, or I'm sorry, digress, regress, I don't want to do digress. When I was in graduate school, that was the work I did in 1975, 76, and 77. 
on multinational corporations with the flow of capital, which is how I came to understand foreign currencies and movement of, of, of capital. And, you know, Ford and GM, these are old established multinational corporations. And you would have think that they would have found uh, him walking back from the TPP, even though Hillary Clinton promised the same thing. And Bernie, Bernie Sanders actually, I think, congratulated Trump for, for making that move, you know, making it officially. So, but Mark Field's response was, look it, it was a good thing because TPP failed to deal with, in his words, the mother of all trade barriers, currency manipulation. Yeah. And I had to go back and listen to it again. Now, this is coming from Mark Fields, the CEO of Ford, and, he's, and he says that. And I go, well, listen, he can't be talking about the Chinese because they weren't in TPP to begin with. So this was a direct ass assault on the Japanese that, hey, the Japanese have weakened their currencies to their benefit, and this is a barrier to trade. And until So you could see that. And, and I found it interesting. So uh, coupling that with what you pulled from Carmen Reinhardt, which a friend of mine had sent me, because I hadn't seen that, uh, but that's the, the project syndicate. And I, I think she comes on FRA too, doesn't she? From the, yeah, she we, we a, post a lot of her exact writing. So yeah, she's great. yeah, and let me tell you this. She, she's great. I know the book was uh, Rogoff Reinhardt, but I would have put Reinhardt Rogoff, okay. to tell you the truth. She's yeah. a really good economist. Yeah. Uh, I uh, usually, I, I, I search out her stuff. Her stuff on financial repression is phenomenal. Yes. It's phenomenal. So, yes. um, so uh, you know, the fact that she wrote that, but that tells me, because when we look at Donald Trump, President Trump, he's a negotiator. So if he went in and said to the, to the automobile manufacturers, and this is what caught my eye, that he, he says to him, look it, this is what I want from you. What do you want from me? And that got my, my antenna up to, to think about this, and I'm usually early on some things, uh, <coughs> is that he, they must have said, look it, the Japanese yen is phenomenally weak. Look at the huge amount of, you know, of imports that we get. In fact, Japan's trade numbers came out today, and they actually turned positive uh, for the first time in a long time on a global basis, but they increased you know, against the U.S., so the, it was a, a cry, say, we need some relief from this. So as a trader, and I know I'm going to be a little early on this, there's a lot of short positions in the Japanese yen out there. I would be very nervous because one thing the Japanese always, they're good. They put their, and I, you know, being a currency trader for, it'll be 40 years in May. Um, they put their, they, they under, they're putting their finger in the air. And then to couple with that, that came out this morning, the Australians, um, mm -hmm. uh, what's his name, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, they, they, they've changed too often. Uh, uh, he, he approached, he sent a, a missive to the Japanese saying, look it, you know, we should carry on with TPP regardless. And the Japanese, uh, oh, hold on, I guess, the Japanese, responded immediately going, no, if the United States is, it, it, it's not worth pursuing. It's dead. Mm. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Malcolm Trumbull uh, wanted to salvage the TPP and the Japanese immediately said, no, mm -hmm. no. Uh, so I find that very interesting uh, mm -hmm. that this is going on. And, and I would be very cautious because I, I think now let's finish up with what you said. Of course, there can't be a pause accord. Can't can't happen because the world is at odds, and you don't have Germany as as, as the article that in, that Carmen Reinhardt writes. She talks about Germany that they will never sit down to this, and the ECB because they're no longer Germany. Right. You have to go through the ECB, and Mario Draghi has now hung himself. He's he's out there hanging. The, the winds are blowing. And I've said that Mario Draghi is the most dangerous man in the world, and I still believe it because I believe that the most dangerous place in the world this year is Europe, not just for so many reasons. It's, and it's not because it's anti-immigrant. It's got a lot of problems, and therefore you could never get a positive court. So if the United States 
<laughs> moves unilaterally. Yeah. To depreciate the dollar. And, and believe me, that's a, that, that's a, that conjecture, it's not even a conjecture. Conjecture, I mean, there's nothing I know except that when I listen to Mark Field, that I know that Trump operates on a give get basis. You give me, let's see what I can give you. And the fact that he doesn't hold to these international deals, because don't forget, there's supposed to be no currency intervention because the G7 and the G20 have agreed to it. Of course, that's nonsense because the Japanese were given the green light in October of 2012 yeah. to, to weaken the currency. And a lot of this monetary policy, which has resulted in financial repression, has been to drive currency values lower. So let, let's be honest. You know, let, let's stop, you know, talking nonsense. <laughs> so, I mean, given the... Uh, the, the trend on this handling of trade arrangements and uh, imposition of tra uh, tariffs on trade. Um, I mean, if the U.S. were to do a, a weakening of the dollar as a unilateral move, um, wouldn't that exacerbate the situation, like especially from the point of view of China and, and Japan, like the could would they not try to uh, weaken their currencies to sort of offset the tariffs? Uh, so if there's like sure, forty percent sure. tariffs sure. on products into the U.S., if they devalue by forty percent, wouldn't that negate that that tariff effect? You, you, yeah, we're not going to see tariffs. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Because I think the global, you know, I understand the taxation. I understand where they're going here. Yeah. With basically, you know, operating the same way, you know, because with Mexico, Mexico has a VAT on imports. You know, and that's the point. Well, that's that's basically a you know a surcharge. Mm -hmm. If you put a VAT on your imports, the United States does the opposite. You know, because we tax exports because that's revenue, and we allow imports in with no VAT. So that's the way they're playing with this. I don't know the way. It, I really, I'm not, I'm not astute enough on the taxation issues of this. Yeah, I don't think you'll see a tariff only because the way global supply chains are so deep now. Yes. You know, this is this is a lot of talk, but global supply chain, which is a good thing. You know, I, I'm a, I, in that regard, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm for global trade. It's, it's a great thing. And yes, and I think a lot of deals are, are changing, Richard. You know, and I, because I think Donald Trump sees, and this is the pushback. And I know, and I know this is a, a, a thing that we'll get into. I haven't even written about it yet, but I'm, thinking more and more about it is that Donald Trump does want to do a reset on the global order because what we call in, in the land of political science, Pax Americana, you know, which evolved after world war two or, you know, even during world war two, when they saw what was happening with Bretton woods and <laughs> the Marshall plan and the, you know, picking Japan up, all these things were done. And, it cost the United States a lot, but to get, but it was a, a, a value trade. You know what? We'll do this. You know, it's not like we're, we are a benevolent, we are. America is a benevolent people. We, we, yeah. There's nobody around the world who's benevolent on an ongoing yes. basis. But it's also, you know, well, you know, is, you know, we can argue the, the philosopher's question about altruism. Yeah, it benefited us. But there's been a huge cost to it. And I don't yes. know whether, you know, Michael Pettis, who I have great respect for and his work on China, he's, he's Michael Pettis, whether you agree with everything, it doesn't matter. He's, he thinks things through. He's brilliant. And he raises the issue about the dollar being an exorbitant um, uh, uh, burden versus, you know, what G Giscard is saying. It said it was an yeah. exorbitant privilege back in the yeah. 60s. Yeah. Yeah. But Michael Pettis says, no, it's an exorbitant burden. And yeah. that's what Donald Trump is saying. The entire global order has been a burden. It's been a burden. And yeah. who's paid that burden? The, the American middle class, especially. It was good for them in, in 50 and 60s and early 70s because the United States dominated the world scene. Yeah. You know, all these people who build these models are devoid of history because they don't have enough time built into them and they don't understand it. But as I used to <laughs> discuss with my father, sometimes it was an argument because he was in the automobile business. And I said, the fifties and sixties were easy. 
because he had no competition. He had no competition. Nice. And eventually, you know, by the time he was 80 years old, he came around to agreeing with me. He says, yeah, it's, it was, it's much harder now because there's a huge global competition. Right, right. But yet, the United States is still, you know, is still funding a lot of that. And that's what Donald Trump is saying. It's yes. not the, this is a long discussion. This is not an easy discussion. Yeah, exactly. It goes along with, like, the Triffin dilemma and the necessity to supply the world with debt as well, right, in terms of bonds. Right, right. What would you say? I, I'm sorry, the Triffin one, yeah. Uh, the, exactly. the, yeah, Triffin's yeah. dilemma, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. It's, it was, you know, it, he was uh, the Triffin dilemma because it, it has a cost. And he's saying, is it worth bearing that cost or is it time that we come to a middle? We yeah. come to a middle. Should the United States keep bearing the burden of that cost? And it's, it's, it's a discussion worth having. But that's why everybody in Washington in the bureaucracies are opposed because don't forget, they've built a life out of Pax Americana and being at the centerpiece of this. Yes. And uh, it's going to be, it's going to get interesting. Yeah. What what will be um, the effects uh, coming out of Europe? I guess uh, not just from a f um, you know sort of driver factors from the U.S., but within Europe, um, do do you see uh, financial repression? Uh, uh, coming out of Europe in terms of um, either, f you know, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, forced inflation, uh, devaluation of the euro. Um, uh, you, you mentioned a lot about Germany potentially capitulating mm -hmm. and acceding mm -hmm. to the demands um, to be the perpetual transfer agents, right, for the rest of Europe's debtors. Right. Well, you, you, you know, and as we sit and talk here, and you listen to Draghi, and he basically, at his last uh, press conference, said, he told the German people, stop crying. You've gotten a lot of benefits. Yeah. It's, you know, and that may be true, but when you, and Merkel's going to have to pick up that baton. This is going to get interesting because she's, she's got an election in September. But if she picks up that baton and says to the German people, look it, we have to bear this burden because we have benefited greatly from being in the European Union. It's true, but you run into the same situation that Hillary Clinton and the Democrats ran into in this past election, which is Donald Trump raises the question of who benefited, who benefited. So if I look at Germany, so who's benefited? The banks, even, even because they're, they're stupid and leverage themselves and arrogant. Who's, so who's benefited? Oh, the big corporations, but Germans the average German citizen, as you rightly talk about, has been financially repressed to pay for this. So they've borne the burden. And in fact, they walked into this. It's not even like U.S. people who are big debtors and with low interest rates, they get an advantage. German people are not large. They don't, they don't live on debt. They're not, they have probably the lowest home ownership of any you know, uh, developed market because people just don't buy, borrow money to buy things. So they're savers, and you know as well as I do, the whole basis of the Financial Repression Authority is talking about people who are financially repressed as the central banks try to bail out. Well, yes. yeah. who, so she's going to have that same problem, and she better be careful because there are reasonable voices raising this issue more and more in Germany, which is why Draghi has to address it because these – these are this this is a this is a um, there's a momentum to this, and this is not about immigrant anti. This is not about a nativist. This is about what's going on, and the, and the Germans can't do anything. Why? Because they don't control their currency, and they don't control the bank. Right. Do you think, uh, given in the past, how uh, central banks have? been in coordination, the major central banks, ECB, Bank of England, uh, Bank of Japan, and the Federal Reserve um, have, have done a lot of coordinated uh, monetary uh, activities in terms of central bank policies. 
and activities. Uh, do you see that as continuing or perhaps breaking down at this point, especially given uh, what you mentioned about the U.S. Uh, and the challenges with the dollar? Uh, so do you think that that coordination between the major central banks will break down? I, I do. I, I, I just don't see it uh, because they're all in different places. Now, now, what do the Japanese do? Now, Corona's put them in a bad spot because what do they do now? What, what do they do? They, they're on this mission of... Of course, they're, they're backwards and they realize it. Now the curve is actually finally starting to steepen in Japan. Well, let's see, it's out to a whole, the 210 in Japan is 28 basis points, I think, today. Let's be 29.2. Um, so they're on this mission where they keep, you know, moving on with quantitative ease and qualitative ease, as they would say, which weakens the currency. So they're going to have a problem here. So yeah. they're off. Now the ECB is also, and if Draghi were to pull back the, the QE, holy cow, rates, rates would rise dramatically in Italy, yeah. Spain, uh, Portugal, dramatically. And, and, then he's, so, and then it would call the question about the banks. So there are some serious, serious issues with this. So, and you could see the Fed's going their own way now because, um, you know, they're looking to fight a battle about, you know, uh, an exorbitant uh, fiscal stimulus. So now all of a sudden uh, they put on their hawkish hats where I thought they should have been long ago. But, you know, what do I know? I'm, I, I live in, I'm from Chicago. I can't possibly know anything. Um, but. It, yeah. And that's all they're talking about now. So that I know will be our next, which will become the topic more and more. I know that uh, uh, Danielle has written extensively about it and called it out, called them out. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> it, there'll be more and more and more of this discussion. But the United States is already going its own way with Donald Trump. So if the Fed were to circumvent, so you, let's end this on this point. If the Fed were to move aggressively, which yeah. I've, I thought they should have been at the Fed fund should have been at two percent long ago, but you know what do I know? I thought there should only been QE one. I understood the purpose of it and the importance of it. QE two and QE three was very superfluous, but we'll, we could argue that. And but it, if the Fed now starts to move aggressively, then I'm willing to bet that that Donald Trump will respond by intervening on the dollar. I say. Wow, what, what will all of this have on the effects of gold prices and the U.S. 10-year Treasury bond, uh, given all of these drivers? Well, I don't know. I, I, I have to tell you, I don't, you know, the, I, I'm always watching the 10-year, I'm watching European, but if you saw the European banks pull back, um, you, know, you know, the 10-year should, hold, if the dollar rallies, let's say that there is no intervention, the dollar rallies because you know, everybody loves America again. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, can't, I, I got to rush to put my money in America. Uh, the 10 should hold, really be range bound. If, if the U.S. intervenes, then I think the 10 years is going to go higher. The yield is going to go higher because yeah. people will start selling, you know, dollar assets. And, yeah. and we've already seen how much the Chinese and others have been, uh, right. uh, you know, so yeah. it's a very tough question. Uh, we'll have to watch the Fed closely. We'll have to watch the economic fundamentals, of course, as we always do, uh, even though this is more an algo-driven market right now. Uh, but the curves are interesting. The curves are steepening all over the world, uh, which is interesting phenomenon. We haven't seen that. So people are selling the longer end, probably in anticipation of some improved global growth. On gold, I, I like gold for several, only because I think that the central banks have been married to this, you know, uh, neg zero to negative interest rate. They really don't know what to do. And if they're seen to panic in any way, that's what gold is good for. Otherwise, it's really amazing that gold is holding up here while the equity market is rallying. You know, yeah. I, I'm looking for, for things that, you know, uh, that that, are, that there's some dissonance with, and you know, and the gold is one of those because 
for the for all the exuberance about the equity market, and not just U.S. equity markets. You know, I, I as you know, I'm more bullish on German equities because there's no alternative in Germany. There, you want to talk where there's no alternative. What are people to do in Germany? If you put your money into cash or into, you're a, you're a major, major loser. So you yeah. can either go into real estate or other hard assets, or you can buy, uh, you know, quality stocks and go, Hey, I can get a three or 4% dividend in a high quality stock. I'm kind of stuck. You know, the U S mentality in 2012 and 13, I got to start jumping on this bandwagon because I got to do something with my money. Yeah. So, so I find, I find it all, in, but you know what? I, I like the gold. I want to see where it holds. That that ten four thousand forty eight dollar area, which you held before, is a very big area. Because again, I cite the November second, two thousand and nine sale of the IMF to the uh, Bank of India. That two hundred ton. That was the price. It, it angered the Chinese. So it seems that there's some that there is very legitimate support at that level. But I'm amazed that the gold has held up as well, as well as it has in the yeah. face of, of of rising equity markets. And that's my bottom line. Okay. Well, that's great insight as always, Ira. How can our listeners learn more about your work? Uh, well, as I say, if you go to iraharris.com and your notes from underground will pop up and you can register. It's free. Yeah. Uh, you know, I write, you know, I write three or four times a week when I'm healthy right now, I'm having a cold, so, but I'm still writing. Uh, and I write to the, t I try to get ahead of what the, you know, of what yeah. the news is and try to see things in that perspective. So, uh, if they go there and register notes from underground, I think they'll really find value in it. Um, we talk about things. There's a great, uh, di dialogue that takes place with my readers. We, we have filtered out all the, all the nasty trolls, uh, and, and we keep it a very civil discussion. Politics does not enter. I don't care about your politics, nor should you care about mine if I'm doing it right. So I try to keep that out of it. And if I raise an issue that may border on politics, I, I will say this is not a political, this is the way I'm seeing it, and here's why. So, I mean, that, that's how. And again, you know, you know, Richard, I push this book, and if you go to the rottenheartofeurope.com, RottenHeartOfEurope.com. Send me an email, and for ten dollars, you can buy the Rotten Heart of Europe, which is the most important book going forward because it it really was so prescient about uh, Europe. Wow! Great, thank you very much, Ira. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only, and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.